Amen. Thank you, Tyler. Good morning, City Light. Um, I'm excited, as always, to dig into God's Word. I was uh, uh, told maybe a little overexcited, kind of like a, a puppy that sees a rabbit in the yard, and you open the door, and whoosh, you're like, there's no way you're keeping up. So I'm going to try to re- refrain a little bit. But just fair warning, buckle in. We got a good word from a good word today, okay? Um, We're spending some time this uh, fall going through our family traits, the core values of our church. We value together. We talk about our core values using four arrows, down, up, in, and out. You got it? Uh, Down is the gospel, the good news that God came down to us to save sinners through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Good news of the gospel. We value that. Uh, Number two, up. That's our response to the gospel. We might call it a spiritual formation. We might call it worship. We might call it sanctification. No matter what you call it, what we value there is the gospel at work in the life of the believer. We're being shaped by it, formed by it, changed by it. The gospel at work in us. It's us looking up to the God who came down saying, we worship you. You with me? Down, up, in is community. It says when we uh, put our faith in Jesus, we become part of the family of God, part of the body of Christ, um, and we could go on with other pictures or metaphors of uh, believers becoming part of a bigger community. And we value that. We value life together with followers of Jesus. And then out is mission. It's the idea that the gospel was never meant to just come to you and stop. It's meant to come to you and move through you to the world around you, a world that needs to know Jesus. Around here, we talk about our mission like this. Our mission is to multiply disciples and churches that love Jesus. So we are on that mission together, down, up, in, out, it's our family traits. It, it's what marks our family uh, as a church, as followers of Jesus. So this morning, we are talking about up, our response to the gospel, the power of the gospel at work in us to change us, shape us, and form us. We value gospel change. I might say it like this. Around here, we believe, we recognize the gospel is a truth that we believe. Words in a book that we read and believe are true. And it's a power at work within everyone who believes. It's a truth that we believe and a power at work in everyone who believes. And so let me... Re, uh, tell you again the truth that we believe. We summarize the gospel in one short sentence like this. The gospel is the good news that God saves sinners through the life, death, and resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ. In short, God saves sinners. And that truth has real power in those who believe it. The power is We can be saved from our sin. I can be saved from my sin. You can be saved from your sin. There is a power at work in this truth. We believe it has real life impact. I listened to a podcast, a couple preachers this last week, uh, Ray Ortland and Sam Alberry are their names. And they were talking about this idea called gospel sanity. Uh, By their definition, gospel sanity happens when the grace and love of God that we see on the pages of Scripture, gospel grace in Scripture, when that is also what we see and experience in real life, that's gospel sanity. When we read the same thing in the pages of the good book, And on the pages of our lives, gospel sanity. 
gospel grace at work. Gospel insanity, then, is when the gospel grace that we see on the pages of Scripture is not something that we see or experience in real life. When there's a disconnect, when it, when it doesn't hold true what we read and what we experience. That's gospel insanity. And it, the, the conversation struck me because I think it gets at the heart of what we're trying to say and communicate when we talk about the core value of up. We value gospel sanity. When the truth and the grace and the love that we see in scripture is also truth and grace and love that we experience in real life. Now, have you guys ever experienced like seasons of gospel insanity? Have you ever been there? I have. I was reflecting on this. I think maybe I saw it clearest in my life early in college. I had just gotten to college, and I remember one night hitting my dorm room floor on my knees, tears in my eyes, convicted of my sin. For the first time, I just felt like my sin has separated me from God. I choose it over God. I am wretched. He is good. There is a gulf between us, and I need a Savior. I remember this night of like deep conviction of sin and then uh, just joy in the grace of Jesus. And I remember after that night, I felt like I wanted everyone else to know this conviction and grace that I had experienced. I wanted everybody else to experience that same thing. And so being the nice guy that I was, I thought I would just convict everyone of their sin, right? You ever been there? So I start asking people questions like, bro, what magazine do you subscribe to? You know, if you lust after a woman in your heart, you lust after a woman with your eyes, you've committed adultery in your heart, you're pretty wretched, dude. You know, I'd say things like, you just spent your money on what? You bought a new what? You better store up your treasure where rust and must, uh, mu- moth and rust. <laughs> I don't, destroy, right? You got stored up there. Get your priorities straight. What's that word I just heard you say? Man, that ain't like building people up. That ain't giving grace. You better clean up your act. I got into a world where I was real good at convicting people of sin. I was real good at laying on guilt and shame. And guess what I was real bad at? The second half of the story. That Jesus came and took all of that sin and paid the price. Took all of that guilt and shame to the cross and buried it in the grave to leave it there for dead. And so the sin that Jesus came and so graciously took off of us, I just tried to strap back on. It's gospel insanity. And I remember going home one day in that kind of season of life, I was talking to one of my brothers about Jesus, and he said, Eric, you know what? When you talk about Jesus, I don't hear any of the grace or love that I see in the Bible. Just hit home. It hit heart. I thought, if the pages of my life are not saying the same thing as the pages of this book, there is a problem. And I hit my knees all over again. And friends, that kind of gospel insanity, uh, I think we all experience times where we get there. And when we talk about this core value of up, what we're saying is... We long for the truth of the gospel and the power of the gospel to both be a clear and present reality in our lives. Where what we believe to be true about what the gospel says, we experience in truth that the gospel does it in our lives. We value gospel sanity. Are you tracking with me? And so, what does that mean? look like? What does it look like to be shaped and formed and changed by the gospel? Does the gospel even really have the power to do that? Is it more than just religious aspirin that can mute the pain of sin and brokenness in our lives? Or can it dig deep and really heal the sin disease that we all have, that we experience 
in the world? Does the gospel have power to shape us and form us and lead to real life change? I would suggest to you today the answer is a resounding yes. The Bible has power. There is power in the gospel. And so I want to make two points today. Usually I got three point sermons. Today I'm going with two. Okay, here they are. There is power in the gospel and gospel power works in you. There's power in the gospel and that gospel power is at work in you. There we go. That's the two. That's where we're headed. Uh, Let's dive in. There is power in the gospel. And friends, I would say to you today, it is an incredible power. It is the power to forgive your sin. It is the power to set you free from sin. It is power not just to make bad people good and good people better. It is the power to make people who were dead in their sin alive in Jesus. It is incredible gospel power. Now, I think the Bible goes overboard to convince us of the truth that there is real life-changing power in the gospel. So overboard, I don't think we can cover it all this morning, so I made a plan. We're going to dig in on one verse to unpack the truth, and then I'm going to pile it on with an overview of a slew of other verses, all right? So we're going to dive in on one, and then I'm just going to pile it on like the Bible does. So gospel power, what does that look like? Colossians chapter 2, Tyler read this for us earlier. I'm going to read it again. Look for gospel power in these words. Here we go. Colossians chapter 2, starting verse 12. I feel like somebody just opened the gate and a puppy is running after the rabbit, all right? So let's go. Having been buried with Jesus in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. And you who were once dead in your trespasses, you who were once dead, In your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. The Bible says that it is the powerful working of God that makes people who were dead in sin alive together with Jesus. The powerful working of God. In the original Greek, those two words, powerful working, are just one word. It's energia. It's the energy, it's the electricity, it's the divine strength of God at work in real people to make, to move them from death to life. The powerful working of God. Okay, how does that work in us? Well, Colossians tells us, let's look at how the Bible unpacks this idea of God's power at work to give uh, dead people new life. Here's what the Bible says. And you who were dead in your trespasses. That is talking to us. We are the dead ones. The Bible says all have sinned. We all fall short. There is no one who is righteous. So no one gets it right. Actually, it's the reverse. We are trespassers. That means we have gone where we ought not go. We have strayed from God whose very breath gives us life. So track with me. If we stray from God and trespass where we shouldn't go, wandering away from the God who gives us life, the only logical result is death. We wander from life to death Our trespasses earn us a death sentence. That's sin. You who were dead in your trespasses, it's you and me. And that is bad news, but that's only the beginning. Because on the heels of the bad news comes the good news that God killed the sin that was killing us. All right? So let's let's dive in there. We're going to see a path 
from death to life because of Jesus' powerful work on the cross. How do we get there? You who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh just means we have not cut out sin from our lives. We're the dead ones. What happened? God made alive together with him. You who were dead, God made alive. God made the dead alive. Somebody else let that land on you. A dead person expired, flatlined, kicked the bucket, dead as a doornail. Rigor mortis has set in, lying in the casket, like dropped into the hole in the ground. A dead person, fully dead, God made alive. Have you ever seen that? That is something that once you lose, you don't get back. Life. No one has that power. That is miraculous. It's counter-human. What ought to be the end is not the end. God made dead people alive. That is an unmatched power. You can't find it anywhere else. You who were dead, God made alive. How does he do that? What does that power look like? The Bible tells us. You who were dead, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses. So when we wandered away from the one who gave us life and we put distance between us and him and we chose death over life, what did God do? He made a way for us to come back to him. He actually came to us and drew us back to him. He forgave our trespasses and our wanderings and brought us back to him. He forgives us. And how does that work? The Bible goes on. By canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. How did God forgive our sins? He sent his son Jesus to take that sin to the cross. It was nailed there and then buried in the grave. Jesus left our sin for dead in that tomb. And then in the most miraculous display of new life power the world has ever known, Jesus the dead one took his own life back up again, broke the seal of the grave that tried to hold him in and walked out to new life that we all can see and know today. That's the gospel. Jesus killed the sin that was killing us. It was God's plan to make a way for those who had trespassed and wandered away from him to be back in relationship with him. That is the power of the gospel at work. New life power. It's not just in Colossians. Let me pile it on. That you might believe this is not a one and done thing in scripture, but it is a theme that the Bible authors want us to know and believe. All right, here we go. I'm piling it on. Romans chapter one. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God. Gospel power. It's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Gospel power. Again, 1 Corinthians chapter one. For the word of the cross... That's the gospel, is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the what? Power of God, gospel power. Again, in 1 Corinthians, but we preach Christ crucified, the gospel. A stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles, but to those who are being called, uh, to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the what? Power of God and the wisdom of God, gospel power. Again, let me give you another one. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel, there it is, came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit with full conviction. Gospel power. 2 Timothy chapter 1. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, that's the gospel, nor of me as prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. 
How do you live a gospel life? Power. There's gospel power in the life of the believer. Let me give you another one. First Peter chapter one, according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope, gospel, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Gospel power. And I don't know if you noticed, but almost all of those come from the beginning of chapter one in all of these letters, which means over and over and over again, the Bible authors are saying there is gospel power and from that flows everything else. It's gospel power. It's real. We've got an embarrassment of riches here. And so friends, at City Light Church, we want you to both know what the gospel says and experience what the gospel does. It's power to give you new life, to shape you, to form you, to change you, to set you free from your sin so that you might know and enjoy Jesus forever. We want you to know what it says and what it does. We want you to know, we want you to value life-changing gospel truth and life-changing gospel power. That is gospel sanity. It is up. There is power in the gospel and we want to know it. You with me? Okay. Point number one. There's power in the gospel. Point number two, gospel power works in you. Say it another way. Gospel power works in gospel people. Okay, we want that to be true. Uh, And so I want to make this point by taking just three steps from there is power in the gospel to gospel power works in you We're going to get from A to B in three steps, okay? Step number one, we see gospel power at work in real people in the Bible. So when the Bible talks about all this gospel power, we don't have to just assume or guess that that might really work out in people's real life. We can see it it at work in real people in the Bible. So let me give you an example. There's a guy, a great missionary church planter named Paul, who was writing to a church in Corinth. And the church in Corinth at that time had people who were like stirring up division and causing trouble, and Paul did not like that. And so he wrote a letter to them saying, I want to come to you and investigate what's going on. And here are Paul's words. Look for gospel power at work in Paul's words in this letter to the Corinthians. Here it is. But I will come to you soon, if the Lord wills, and I will find out not the talk of these arrogant people, but power. For the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. So Paul is saying, when I come visit you, my primary goal is not just to hear what these guys are saying and get into uh, debates with them about theological minutia so that I can prove them right or wrong. He's saying, if they believe what is true, then I should be able to see that gospel power at work in their real lives. So I don't just want to come and hear what they have to say. I want to come and see how they live. He's looking for gospel power in the lives of real people. What kind of power is he looking for? Well, he's looking for the power that unites divided people. Gospel power does that because Jesus crossed the great divide of death so that we could be united with him. That same thing works in us. What kind of power is he looking for? It's the power to forgive people who hurt you because Jesus forgave you. What kind of power is he looking for? It's the power to love people that you once hated because Jesus loved you even when you hated him. Paul's looking for gospel power at work. How did he know what to look for? Well, Paul had experienced gospel power to change uh, real life in his own life, 
right? We know from uh, the Bible's account that Paul at one time had risen high up in the ranks of people who were persecuting the church. He was one of the best at it. And, and that job and rising up through those ranks earned Paul some wealth, some influence, some accolades. He's at the top of his game. He had it made. He had it good until Jesus entered into his story. And he wrote another letter to a church in Philippi, and he describes the change that happened in his life. Again, let me read to you Paul's words. This is what he said gospel power did in him. He writes, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, as trash, as something that I discarded because I found something better. I've suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. And I read that and I think, why on earth would someone suffer the loss of all things? Why on earth would someone give up everything? And Paul's at the top of his game. He's making good money. People are listening to him. He's getting cheered on in what he does. Then he gave it all up. I mean, I feel like that'd be like Tyler cutting off that sweet wave he's got going on in his hair and having to look at a receding hairline like mine every morning when he wakes up. Why give it up when you got it good, right? That's what Paul did. He suffered the loss of all things. Why? So that I may be found in Christ, Paul says to know him and the power of his resurrection. See, what Paul realized was that his life was marked by death. There were people that he hated. There were people that he persecuted. There were people that he murdered. He was driven by and motivated by death. And when Jesus entered in, he changed all of that. He saw that Jesus, though Paul rebelled against him, Jesus didn't reject him. Jesus didn't cut him off. Jesus didn't take his life. Instead, Jesus gave his own life so that Paul might know life. It was an utter reversal of what had motivated Paul all the time that he had lived. And so Paul said, I'm giving up all of that all of that motivation, all of that death, all of that hatred that I may know Christ and the love and the grace and the resurrection, the new life power of the gospel. I need a new life and I found it in Jesus. And out of that heart, Paul just had this desire that everyone else would know it too. He was looking for it in the churches that he planted, in the places that he went, the people that went along with him. Paul saw gospel power at work in his own life. And so we're on this path. There's power in the gospel. Gospel power works in you. Step number one, we see gospel power at work in real people in the Bible. Step number two, uh, gospel power is a for all generations, forever kind of power. So what we see in the Bible doesn't stop When the people in the Bible died, it's a for all generations, forever kind of power. Let me uh, uh, read it to you in scripture. Ephesians chapter 3 says, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, gospel power in us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus, throughout all generations, forever and ever, amen. So to the God who's powerfully at work in us, be glory by that power for all generations, forever and ever, amen. That gospel power is a for all generations, forever kind of power. It started in Acts chapter two with Peter and the other believers at Pentecost. And it continued from there when Jesus met Paul on the road to Damascus and he had a dramatic life change and uh, he went on mission with Peter and the other believers and their word continued to spread throughout the book of Acts. And in this letter to the church in Ephesus, Paul says, and that power will be at work in this generation 
and the next generation, and the next generation, and the generation after that, and then they'll pass it on to forever and ever, amen. Gospel power is an unstoppable, unrelenting, irrepressible power in God's people forever. You with me? And so while we're here on this sidestep in Ephesians chapter 3, uh, on the stop, I, I want to take a sidestep. Because in this text, it gives us an idea of the magnitude of the power of God, right? Did you catch it? The power at work in us, how big it is. The Bible says, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think. How big is the power of God at work in his people? It's far more abundant than all that you could ask or think. Imagine that. Imagine your greatest hope of what Jesus could do in your life. Imagine your greatest hope for what God could do in the world. His power is able to do far more abundantly than that. And if that's true, then this morning, I think just we as a people can lay aside the idea that we could ever express a hope or a need that exceeds God's power to provide it. Are you with me? We just could never concoct an idea or a need that goes beyond God's power at work within us to provide it. Now, I'm not, I'm not suggesting a name it and claim it kind of faith or that we are in control of God's power and he's like a genie that just does what we want. No, uh, so don't go there. What I am saying is that we can ask God for the greatest hopes, the greatest dreams, the greatest needs that we could ever imagine because it cannot exceed his power to meet it. Are you with me? And so let me just ask you some questions. What do you need forgiven from? What baggage are you carrying that you need God to take from you? His power is not too small to forgive even that. Where do you need to be set free from sin right now? What patterns are there in your life that you just know, man, they keep me from God? I feel dirty because this is true about me. It's the parts of your life that you try to hide. Where is it? The power of God is not so small, it cannot set you free even from that. Who in your life needs to know Jesus that doesn't? Is there someone that maybe you've even lost hope for? God's hand is not too short to save. He saved Paul, who's literally murdering Christians and made him one of the greatest church planting missionaries ever to walk the earth. His hand is not too short to save. Friends, in light of that, let's make our prayers and hopes as great and fantastic as the God to whom we send them. Amen? And so, we're on this path. There is power in the gospel. That gospel power is at work in you. We're taking steps. First, we see it at work in real people. So it happens. And those people said, it is a for all generations forever kind of power. And so that would include this generation and the next generation and the one after that. And on this last step to God's, the gospel power at work in you, I just want to circle back to gospel sanity. The idea that there may be seasons in life where you feel like, man, the grace and truth and power of the gospel that I see on these pages, I just don't see in my own life. What do we do then? What hope do we have? Well, this last step on the path, I I say we see gospel power clearest in our weaknesses. It's clearest in our weaknesses. So, um, Let's just go to Paul. Paul says, "Mm, let me start with me. Do you ever just feel weak? You ever go there? Like you read what's in scripture and then you look at your own life and you're like, ah, I just don't see it. And not only do I not see it, I just don't know if God could ever use someone like me. Like I have real weaknesses, God. I like Like myself, I can't organize my way out of a wet paper sack. How am I going to lead a church, right? I've got temptations that, that follow me regularly. 
God, is that weakness in me? How could you use someone like me? God, I lose my temper with my kids. You're a good father. Oftentimes, I feel like I am not. Could you ever use me? What does that look like? God, there are times I love myself much more than I love people in my church, in my community. I'm a wretched man. Could you ever use me? Does anybody else, you ever get to a point where you see the scriptures and you see who God wants you to be and created you to be and you say, you know what? I'm just not that. I'm too weak. I'm too stressed out. I'm too exhausted. I'm too overwhelmed. I can't do it. You ever been there? If you have, you are in good company because Paul himself was there. And his words speak right into that situation. But um, Paul uh, wrote this. But God said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weaknesses. Paul says, therefore I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest on me. What was going on here is Paul said he had a thorn in his flesh. I don't know what that was, but it's jabbing at him. It's making him weak. And he's like, you know what, God? If you would just remove this thorn in my flesh, then I would be stronger. If you would take away this thing that plagues me, that I can't get rid of on my own, then you could really, I'd be a stronger tool in your toolbox for missional advancement. God, if you would take this away from me, then I'd be ready. Then I could go. God, if you could take this away from me, then I wouldn't be humiliated because I'm not as strong as I ought to be. I'm not the man that I could be. God, if you would just take this away from me, then, and he asked God, and you know what God said? My grace is sufficient for you. He doesn't take the thorn away. My power is made perfect in weakness. And Paul says, oh man, if that's true, then I'm going to boast in my weaknesses. My strengths aren't going to be what I brag about anymore. It's going to be my weaknesses that I brag about. God says, I'm not taking away the thorn because my grace is enough. Paul, what I don't want is for you to think you're strong enough to do this without me. What I want is for you to know my grace meets you even at your weakest. Paul, what I don't want is for you to put your strength on display for the world. What I do want is for people to look at you and see gospel power at work even where you're not strong. It is a it is a perspective-changing, life-changing word that Paul got. So he starts boasting in his weaknesses. Imagine it. Like Doug boasting in his peach fuzz because he needs more help from God to grow a beard. Right? It's like me boasting that I can't reach the top shelf because God needs to help me get those things down. Right? It's like boasting. God, I am tempted all the time. Yet I have not fallen recently because your grace is enough. Boasting in weaknesses. God, I struggle to love those people who seem so unlovable to me, but I know you love them and I haven't hated for a while. That's your power at work within me. God, it is hard to be united in a divided world. I, I, I don't know what that looks like, but guess what? I haven't experienced division in months. It's your grace at work within me. You see how rather than doing a strengths finders assessment and saying, God, how are you going to use me at my strongest to give you the glory? Maybe we ought to be doing weakness finders assessments. Where we say, God, we're weak, but you're strong. And so we want to boast there. We want to put that on display. The Bible says we're like clay pots that hold the power of the gospel. You know what clay pots are good at? Chipping and cracking and breaking. You know what they're really bad at? Holding stuff in. And so God says that's like what we are. We're chipped and cracked and broken. And you know what the glory of that is? The power of the gospel just spills out of us all the more. 
And so Paul rejoices in his weaknesses. He boasts, he brags, I am not strong. So any strength you see in my life is thanks to the God whose power works mightily in me. It's a whole different sort of testimony. And so friends, when we look for the power of the gospel in our lives, we look to where we're weak. It means if you feel weak, you are qualified for the power of God to be at work in you. There's power in the gospel, God's power works in you. His grace where we're tempted, his love where we're unlovely, his kindness where we're rebellious, his forgiveness where we have failed, his freedom where we've been chained. There is power in the gospel and it is at work in all who believe, amen? Will you guys pray with me? Awesome God. Man, if I'm honest, before you and all these people, uh, I've just felt weakness. Even this week, God, I've felt how far I am from the man that you want me to be. Even crafting this message, I just feel totally unable to capture and convey the magnitude and the glory of the power of your gospel in our lives. And I know that my feeling of weakness and inadequacy is not mine alone. We all get there. And so God, today, would you meet us here? Would you give us that kind of moment that Paul had where we're looking for our strengths, asking for our weaknesses to be covered up and removed and shored up? God, would you change our hearts that we might look at our weaknesses Say, God, would you be strong there? Would you meet me there? God, where I am tempted, would you sustain me? Where I have failed, would you forgive me? Where I feel unlovable and unable to love those around me, God, would you love me and fill me up so that I can love others too? And God, for For everyone who feels weak here today, would you give us hope that you never expected us to match the power of God? You just expect us to know the power of God, to know it within us, to let it shape us and form us and change us, to move us from dead in our sin to alive in Jesus now and for all generations forever and ever. Amen. Jesus, would you make gospel change a family trait in this family, in each of us? Would would the people outside these doors look in on us, our hearts and our homes, and say, man, they're a different person. There's a change there that they could not have accomplished on their own. It must be some supernatural or divine change. It must be God. God, would your power work so mightily in us that it is a testimony to your glory and your grace. For the name and fame of Jesus and the good of his people, we ask in your name. Amen. See in there the great I am.